Hi, my name is Dave Fortune. I am a senior technician at UWE Creative Arts and Industries. I'm also a visiting lecturer and organize summer schools and courses. I've worked at UWE for many years. When I first started working at this establishment, it was Bristol Polytechnic. Okay, I'm gonna go through sort of history of the process of potted history. Screen printing or serigraphy originated in China about AD 221 as a way of transferring designs onto fabrics. A truly remarkable level of expression and mastery was reached by the Chinese artists with the creation of special masks, also known as matrixes. As we today understand, was probably meant to be a print frame. The making of such masks was an extremely complex process. The small pieces which created the mask were glued together with human hair, allowing the ink to pass through cleanly. The ink was daubed through with special stencil brushes. No squeegees then. Following this, the Japanese began using simple stenciling techniques as a way to create imagery. At this time, stencils were cut out of paper and the mesh was woven from human hair as silk. Stiff brushes were used to force the ink through the mesh onto the fabric. In China and Japan, the use of stencil was popular for decorating cloth. The Japanese improved this technique and their use of fabric dyeing stencils called eyes katagami, which were finely cut paper stencils used in the printing of cloth, typically cotton, silk or other cloth used for kimono or other Japanese garments. Fine designs were held in place with hairs of silk threads Later, these stencils were improved by using two layers of oiled mulberry paper. This technique was very similar to the screen printing technique of today, but without the squeegee. The ink was daubed through the stencils. Early in the 1910s, several printers experimented with photoreactive chemicals. Roy Beck, Charles Peter and Edward Owens studied and experimented with chromic acid salt sensitized emulsions or photoreactive stencils. This trio of developers would prove to revolutionize the commercial screen printing industry by introducing photo-imaged stencils. Though the acceptance of this method would take many years. Screen printing now uses sensitizers far less, less toxic than bichromates. A company called Velvetone created large-scale Levi advertisements by developing uh, an effective print process that produced brilliant results. A multitude of colours, over a dozen in some cases, each printed on separate colour screens until the final piece practically glowed. Wall-sized Levi murals came to life in full colour thanks to Velvetone Company, a San Francisco-based business that pioneered screen printing in the 1910s. It created a vibrant advertisements for Levi Strauss and Co and others. Velvetone not only boosted the jeans business, but developed a framework for graphic design printing called Coravels. The finished prints were glued to corrugated cardboard and would be rolled up like a scroll and shipped to locations throughout the West. In the early part of the 20th century, squeegees were introduced as a way of pulling the ink through the screen mesh. Different profile blades for paper and fabric printing. In 1938, New York group of artists began experimenting with screen printing as an artistic medium onto paper and later formed the State Seriographic Society, coining the word ser serigraphy later in the 1930s to differentiate the artistic application of silkscreen printing from manufacturing use of the process serigraphy. Um, serigraphy is a combination word for the Latin word seri, silk, and the Greek word graphing, to write or draw. In the 1960s, pop artists such as Peter Blake, Andy Warhol, Robert Rauschenberg, Bridget Riley and many others were using screen printing as an integral element in their practice. 
thus establishing it and popularizing it as a medium for create, creating contemporary art. At this time, screen printing and pop art became very popular with poster design, design, especially for music events and band posters. Here are some of these iconic images. When I first started screen printing in 1967, hand cut stencils were popular and cheap. You cut the top green layer with a scalpel and peeled away the print areas. You would then place the cut green film under the back of the screen, run a damp sponge evenly over the whole stencil and iron it on. You would then peel away the backing paper, leaving the design stuck to the mesh, ready to print. There was quite an art cutting text, especially finer text, as the film was very unforgiving. The first photographic film I used was called Ilano Five Star and was a very sensitive film which you expose sandwich with a film positive. You would then, in a large tank of 40% mix of hydrogen peroxide, develop the film and wash out with hot water. It was rather a time-consuming and delicate process, and the stencils didn't actually last that long. It could only be used with solvent-based inks. They then came up with Novastar, a cold water washout stencil film. This was a great help, as many on many occasions, we had hot water problems at the university. Five star stencils were ruined as cold water wouldn't wash them out. At this time, the inks we were using were all solvent based and pretty toxic. You sort of got used to using solvents, which were very intense and very unhealthy. My poor hands were always cracked and dry, and I can remember on many occasions floating home in the car. In those early days, I worked at Bristol Polytechnic, now UWE. I worked with Martin Axon, who became a great friend. He took care of the process photography for graphics and illustration, and was also a very good photographer. We started a print editioning studio called Silver Screen Fine Printers. One of our first interesting commissions was the Onofini Gallery in Bristol, printing an exhibition poster for Bridget Riley exhibition in 1974. Martin now lives in the USA and is one of the top platinum and palladium print experts over there. In 1988, Professor Niels Zumbhagen, who was lecturing at the Berlin Academy of Arts, visited the Faculty of Art, Media and Design, which at that time was Bristol Polytechnic. He was very impressed with the quality of the work being produced in the screen printing area, but could not understand why we were still using solvent-based inks. Further interest was stimulated when Niels showed a selection of his work. This is some of the first images I saw that Niels had produced in 1989. Professor Paul van der Leyen, Dean of the Faculty, and Richard Anderton, Head of Printmaking, arranged for me to visit the University of Arts in Berlin to research water-based screen printing and related chemistry. Returning to Bristol, armed with this new safe system, no solvents, no thinners, and the whole process within COSH regulations, I set about implementing this newfound knowledge within the faculty screen printing areas, new textured films. Screen monoprinting techniques have been more controllable as the inks dry much slower on the screen. Monoprinting with watercolours is just a delight. You can produce up to four copies using the technique with no rush at all and no drying in. On my return to Bristol, I proceeded to clear all the solvent inks out. And by the beginning of September, 1989, the new non-toxic water-based screen printing area was up and running. It was wonderful to have a safe, healthy environment to work in for the students and for me. An offshoot of the non-toxic process was water-based ceramic or decal transfer printing. After a conversation with Rich Anderton, then head of printmaking, we decided to research water-based ceramic transfers. The ceramic transfer process was always an incredibly toxic and unhealthy process. When using the old cover coat, nobody would enter the studio for some time as the toxic smell was overpowering. It just hung in the air for days. 
We produced the first water-based transfers as a collaboration with CFPR. The process was now working beautifully without the unhealthy components of the solvent-based techniques. The process was now working beautifully without the unhealthy components of the solvent-based techniques. This mix of onglaze powder with mediums and varnishes also printed beautifully on enamel panels or enamel uh, surfaces to be fired in an enameling kiln. Um, so this side of the process is also really interesting. I've organised and run summer schools and workshops with Elizabeth Turrell, who is well known and respected within the Vitreous Enamel Fraternity. I'm very lucky now to have the Studio Jujelo in Siena to run summer schools and courses from in screen printing and water-based ceramic decal printing. This is uh, some of uh, Elizabeth's work, one of her, her uh, images on enamel. And there's a few pictures of Sienna here. Beautiful Sienna. This is part of the studio, the accommodation, and it's fabulous. The studio is usually there. This is a run through of the whole process uh, at UWE in our screen printing area. Uh, the film we use, a sensitive grained film for mark making called Mark Resist, comes in large sizes uh, for drawing on, takes many different marks, pencil, graphite, uh, rotary ink with meths, fabrics, any mark that will, that will hold the light back works really well. Screens we use, uh, polyester screens, average mesh count 120T, but we have uh, larger meshes, um, 90T, and for fabrics we've got 43T, which really pushes the ink through. But an average size is 120T. This screen you can see here is a finest screen, a 150 screen for very fine half tone work. The emulsion we use is a direct emulsion and we apply it with a coating trough. The coating trough has got to be well looked after because if you dent the front edge or it's dirty, it gets dropped, you just will not get a decent coating. What will happen is it'll be streaky or thick, uh, which when dry just won't expose properly. So the coating trough uh, has got to be half filled all the way along and then with even pressure and at the right angle as you can see on the um, image you carefully pull to the top of the screen. This um, is fiddly and uh, the first couple of screens you, you, you will uh, attempt will probably not be very good and uh, you'll have to wash off with cold water, dry and start again. But once you've um, applied it properly, as we can see in this picture, nice smooth coat, single coat, we only do a single coat on the back of the screen, uh, it's ready then to go into the drying cabinet. Wash the coating trough with water, everything's washed with water as there are no solvents involved. Um, the edge of the coating trough is very important because if it gets chipped or dropped uh, any little chips will show in the coating uh, look really bad because you'll get streaks in the stencil. The exposure unit um, is uh, delicate in the way that the glass is easy to scratch. Uh, it's a problem sometimes if uh, people have uh, any diamond rings on or any stones of any description. One scratch in the middle of the glass causes problems with half tones. In fact, we've had the glass change over the years about three or four times. The image goes right reading on the glass, which means that the way you drew it, uh, facing you, right reading. Coated screen on top, carefully. Uh, so your image is up against the back of the screen. 
and there it is under the screen. You close the lid. The piece of string is to help with the vacuum. It'll help suck the air out from the image uh, inside the, the frame. Lock it and turn the vacuum on. Takes a minute to suck down. Um, and with the piece of string there, it quite quickly sucks down into the edges of the screen. You need complete contact. Without that contact, you won't get a decent stencil. Uh, swivel it uh, to uh, the upright position. There's the stencil up against the back of the screen. Uh, and of course, you're looking at it to, at the moment back to front. But when it washes out, it'll be the right way round. There's the light source, not good for you. Metal halide, uh, not good at all for your eyes. Um, you've got to be very careful. Uh, that's why we've got the controls outside. This external control um, has got a timer on there um, and it's set at 65. Um, we know that that's the right time because we've done lots of tests, um, but it's 65 segments of time. Uh, and a seg each segment is four seconds, in fact. Um, and as the bulb gets older, it will actually uh, take longer. That, that uh, segment of time will change to five seconds, probably. So at 65 seconds, that's a good all-round exposure time. We use 60 sometimes. But and if we were using the, ex the actual screens for fabric printing, textile screens with a bigger mesh, which holds a lot more emulsion, we'd have to expose for longer, much longer. So the light source is lined up, so there's some marks on the floor so that you know it's the right distance. You press the button, uh, which you do from outside. I, I don't know why I'm in there at that point, actually. Um, once it's exposed, it counts down, it, it turns the light off automatically. You take the screen out um, carefully. And remember that it is still very sensitive to light, especially ultraviolet light. So when you take it from the frame uh, there, because uh, it's in, 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 uh, under the rubber, uh, suddenly you're in daylight and it's going to start exposing. Now, if you take too long and it exposes, you'll be washing out the screen and you'll think uh, there's a fine layer of green emulsion in the image. And that's because it's exposed, um, uh, which means you'll have to make the stencil again because it won't print properly. Wash out with cold water, both sides. Uh, I usually wet the whole screen both sides first to get it started, then evenly wash both sides of the screen with cold water. And you'll see this, the image appear in negative, remembering that the ink goes through these clear areas. The next stage is to blot it and dry it in the drying cabinet. Um, doesn't take long. Uh, it's it's uh, usually a 10 minute job. Then we take it out and we use some green filler. If you hold it up against the light, you might see some pinpricks or little areas that haven't uh, uh, chipped off because of bits on the glass. Uh, but anyway, you touch out with this green filler carefully. Just use a thin layer of green filler. Doesn't take long to dry. And the squeegee, squeegee blade's important. It's uh, medium soft, Everlast rubber. Um, it's sort of uh, more medium than soft, actually. I think if you go too soft, you can have problems. It might even be a medium hard, I can't remember. The blades last a long time, anyway. You gotta make sure that they're set square into the handle. Sometimes after a long time of pulling images, you'll find, you'll look along the edge and you'll find that there's a curve in it where it's pulled out of the, uh, the handle. So make sure that it's always, uh, um, I usually hold it up and just put your eye along it, just make sure it's a, it's, it's a straight line. Um, we use tape, uh, which is now, with this one is a plastic tape, but the new tape we use is biodegradable. I've not used it yet, it's one of my colleagues found it, and we're going to be using it from next semester. We also now use biodegradable veggie cups, they're clear cups which will break down, um, they're not plastic. In fact, for this film we're using plastic, but the new ones 
are clear. We use System 3 acrylics, which are fantastic. We use lots of them, lots and lots of them. They do different mediums. This is a paper and board medium. They do a textile medium as well. Uh, I usually start with the medium because uh, it's got retarder in it, which means it will slow the drying of the mix straight away. Sometimes if you mix the pigments first and you leave them a little while, they get grainy. But because the medium has got retarder in it, as soon as you mix the two together, it slows the drying. So I always start with the screen printing medium and then add colors or mixtures of colors. 50-50 mix, which is the maximum mix. Uh, you can go a little bit more than that, 60-40 acrylic, once you know what you're doing. We've got tinters. If you want to have any, uh, a transparent mix, you can add as little medium uh, pigment as you want. So you can just add you know, a small percentage of pigment to get very transparent colors. Okay, we're ready to set up. So you place your image, your positive that you've drawn or your film positive on the paper where you want it to print. The technique I'm using this time is I'm going to look through the screen to line it up. So it's ta taped to the paper. I'm going to lower the screen and then by looking through, I'm going to get it to line up. And this is for position on the paper. The three little tabs on my finger are the stops. You call them tabs or stops or registration marks, some people call them. Once it's in position, you put three registration marks down and you're more or less ready to go. You take the film positive off the paper, don't leave it on like I do sometimes, and print the positive by accident. It's very easy to do, <laughs> and I've done it many times. Ink mix goes along the bottom of the screen, but some people put it along the top of the screen. It doesn't matter really either way, but put down plenty of ink. Don't skimp with the ink. Vacuum on, but you don't actually need a vacuum. A lot of the time you can get away without a vacuum. Um, flood the image uh, one way and then flood the ink the other way. On the first pull, I usually flood twice uh, just to charge the screen. By flooding the ink across, you're charging the mesh with ink and print. And as you can see, there's a, by looking at the picture, you see the slight bend on the squeegee. So you're putting quite a bit of pressure on the 45 degree angle, which gives you a great print edge, okay? If you hold it too upright, you can get problems. If you hold it too far over, you can get problems. So 45 degrees is usually about right. Then lift the screen slightly and flood the ink back. And there's your print, your first print. Lovely crisp print, lots of detail. You can see all of these lovely little fine marks. Uh, if you get the exposure time right and your image isn't too transparent, they work beautifully, absolutely beautifully. And there's our racks. We have three or four sets of racks at the university. Keeps them separate and they dry very quickly. I would imagine that probably these prints would have been dried within about 10, 15 minutes, ready for another color. So when you finish printing, leave the screens coated with ink, flooded with ink. This will stop it drying into the mesh. Scrape the ink off the squeegee and scrape the ink off the screen as well, the bulk of it. Um, I usually uh, wash the screen first, but for some reason in this uh, PowerPoint I've made, I've uh, taken the screen out, but the squeegee washed uh, there first. I shouldn't have done that really. I probably didn't. It's probably got the slides mixed up. I usually wash the squeegee first because if there's ink on the squeegee and it dries on, there's not going to be cause a problem. I've had squeegees left overnight. They've been completely dry. I usually just put them in a bucket of warm water and they're okay again. But the mesh, um, if it dries in the mesh, it's more difficult. We have to use something um, called Pregan paste, which only we use, which is a, a mild sort of uh, caustic paste but it takes everything out of the screen, but only we use it. Okay, to get rid of the stencil, I mean, if you wanted to print the stencil again, it's fine. They're very hard, tough. Um, you could uh, just dry it and set it up again and print another color. And you could do that as many times as you wanted, really, because the stencils are so tough that you don't lose the edge. You always get a really good print from them. So the Pregasol F, a tiny jet of Pregasol F, with a soft brush, spread it both sides 
And um, as I say, we're not using a lot of this chemical. There are no crosses on it. There are no warnings on it. I'm just very careful with all chemicals, and we only use this one, really. Um, we have an extractor on above on the washout tank, so which drags all the air out anyway. But I'm always very careful. Uh, then after a couple of minutes, you mustn't leave the Precursor Lef on the screen for more than two or three minutes. If it dries on the screen, it actually re reverses what it's supposed to do and it uh, hardens the stencil like Aerodite and they're really difficult to clean off then. So only two or three minutes with the Precursor Lef. Then power wash. Both sides. Um, don't start the power washer on the screen or you can burst a hole into the screen, especially if you're close to the edge. Or if there's a tiny nick out of the screen, certainly don't power wash it. It'll just split the screen. Uh, so you power, power wash the whole area a couple of times, hold it up to the light, check it out, wash it out again with a bit of water in case there are any bits on the mesh. And then uh, you can either put it straight back in the rack or you could dry it if you wanted to use it again quickly. These screens don't actually wear out. They seem to actually get broken most of the time. Okay, here's some images, screen printed images. Um, uh, this is one that I did recently for um, an exhibition. Um, a lot of these images uh, I've printed for other people. Um, but as you can see, the detail and the quality of the images are beautiful, even golds. Um, these were books I've printed, Sandy Sykes I did this book for. Um, that's a double page spread from the book. Um, these uh, were fabulous prints, but in the way that they were great slabs of colour. Absolutely. Screen printing is just wonderful for big solid colours and uh, they uh, print beautifully. Detail, this is the 95 LPI screen I was talking about earlier. And it's a tritone, but beautiful quality. That's quite big as well. I think that was about a A2 size, that image, or maybe bigger. Uh, a set of images there, all similar. Um, this girl used a, uh, she had a brain scan and managed to get hold of the x-rays and converted them into positives and then worked into them with Photoshop. And they become beautiful images, actually. Beautiful. As you can see, you know, um, most students print sort of a dozen or so images and uh, or, or, or vary the colours. Again, beautiful slabs of colour with silk screen printing. Absolutely fabulous. There are just so many. This is uh, drawn uh, uh, on the textured drawing film with, um, I think she's used China Graph Pencil and Rotring Ink and then scratched into it with uh, sandpapers. And these are half tones. Um, this is a bitmap half tone. Big image as well. That one was A1 size. Color separations. My lovely dog who died a few years ago. So I, I did a mono stroke um, uh, photographic image of Flory. <laughs> it's on the wall now. Color separations, lots of uh, CMYK. These are some of my mini print images. Another color separation. This was a set of uh, images I did for Alton Weigberg Ink Company years ago. I found them in an old book. And I, they were only little gray images. So I redid the artwork went to see Alton Weiberg and they, as soon as they saw the ones I'd printed, they ordered me to, or asked me if I would print uh, sets, hundreds of huge calendars, uh, which were beautiful in fact, but I had to use their inks, which weren't very nice because these were solvent based in those days. But it actually won an international competition, the calendar competition, which was fun. Uh, color separation, color separation. Uh, this is interesting. I did this just last semester. We printed um, a varnish onto steel. Uh, we had to use a, I used a, a polyurethane or a yacht varnish, I think. This was an oil based one. Printed it uh, onto the steel uh, 
um, as a negative and uh, once it was dry and it was put outside it rusted as a positive so the the brown is the image which is rust so that was really interesting wallpaper fantastic wallpaper somebody's tried printing there well actually she's got gold leaf on there as well beautiful uh, that's uh, litho etching and screen prints uh, mixed media image um, this is a colleague of mine her imagery is beautiful um, as they say solids of ink fantastic MA students do a lot of work with me as well. In fact, uh, quite a few of them have been to the studio Giuslo in Italy in the summer with me. This is um, a spot color image using fluorescent inks. A lot of colors there, but it's really fun. Uh, this is some tests I was doing with uh, a different sort of ink. As I say, great for solids of color. Uh, different colors blends of color um, great to use though it's uh, I mean the process itself I'm I actually love the process you never seem to get fed up with it uh, and then some watercolor images um, these images this is actually painted on the screen with old inks so you actually only get one mono uh, image with this so this is a mono image one color uh, one screen uh, everything painted on the screen uh, but you're going to get one image out of that um, this is the watercolor mono printing where you get up to four images they gradually fade but it's very sensitive and quite a fun process that in fact is um, uh, an image that was printed in Payne's gray uh, a hand rendered image which we exposed and printed but then the watercolour mono was over the top of the image and because the uh, watercolours are quite transparent it, it works beautifully. Some more watercolour tests there on the screen with tape. So and then ceramic decal and vitreous enamel work. Uh, this is some of our MAs from years ago I think. That's uh, enamel or copper. Same there. Some of the stenciling, some done by hand. Uh, it's a fabulous process and there's some different uh, a little test sheet of lots of different uh, transfers on copper uh, this is screen printed uh, onto paper clay uh, which is, uh, is beautiful some of the Elizabeth Turrell's work uh, and this is uh, at one of my summer schools, uh, sliding the transfers after they've been printed. We just tried some on tiles, just ordinary bathroom tiles. So you slide them off by um, soaking them in a dish of tepid water and then sliding them onto the tile and then blotting with um, newsprint or with tissue. And then once it's dry, it goes straight into the kiln. And some of these were the first early results. They're fun. Uh, that one actually hasn't been fired yet, so you can just see the transfer in the background. But when it fires, the transfer burns away, and the um, the anglaise uh, image drops down into the glaze of the dish. There's a couple of samples there. These are very early. Some of these, some of the first. In fact. interesting and, and it's really fun the process is fun so you can find text you can uh, print anything really in the anglaise mix uh, very similar to the um, ordinary inks it does tend to dry in the mesh a bit quicker so you've got to be a little quicker with the print side that's uh, I think that's transfer it onto an old shovel that's been enameled. I love that actually. And these were the big panels I printed that were going to be floated on a wall. I think it was at a school or a hospital or somewhere. There were a set of six of these panels and they were big, um, big panels. So that must be about 30 by 40 inches, I think, something like that, each panel. 
pre-enameled panels into a massive kiln that we had at the time at the university. It's not there anymore. I think it costs too much to run. So they go into the kiln. When they come off, they cool, come out, they cool down, and uh, they're sort of indestructible because it's like glass, really, the surface enamel, vitreous enamel. There's the set of together, the whole six designs. And that's my book, which uh, um, has sold really well. And that's me. So that is the end of this whole talk, really. Um, if anybody uh, wants to contact me, uh, they can contact me. Um, email. It's Dave Fortune Serigrapher at gmail.com. So if you have any questions or you're interested in any um, problems, please contact me. Thank you very much.